Uh, We're turning to Romans chapter 13 for our meditation this morning. Romans chapter 13. But I want to, uh, before we begin, I want to sort of give you a a brief summary of what we've thought about thus far in the epistle to Romans. Uh, We know uh, this uh, letter was written by the Apostle Paul. He was planning to go on a missionary journey, and he wanted to uh, have support from the believers in Rome. And so he writes to introduce himself to this uh, church. Um, But it's a church that is going through difficult times. It's a church that's seeking to understand who it is and what it is to be a believer. It seems that it is divided ethnically. We said at the very beginning of our study together that it seems likely that uh, there is a division within the church in Rome, that perhaps those from a, a Jewish heritage and those from a pagan heritage are at loggerheads in some way. Right at the beginning of this church, it's likely that the, most of the believers were Jewish, and the leadership of the church would have been Jewish, and uh, uh, they would have grown up understanding that. But as more and more uh, people were added to the church from a pagan background, then the power started to change. And then, of course, there was a time when the emperor uh, made a lot of Jewish folk leave the city. And so then the church became very Gentile in its flavor. It became very Gentile in its understanding. And then as the the Jewish believers filtered back, they found a church radically different from the one that they knew and understood. And so there seems to be a division here. And Paul, even though he has not visited Rome up until this point, he understands that there is this division going on. He understands something of what's happening within their thinking. And so he writes to them. He writes his great treatise on salvation, on what salvation is, helping them to understand the universal nature of salvation, the fact that it encompasses both those from a pagan and Jewish background, and it means the same. And so he writes to them, and he writes to them explaining what salvation is, but as he does so, he is He is answering questions that come from an interlocutor, a conversational partner. He's thinking about what believers from a Jewish background would say to these particular things that he's teaching. And he's preempting their questions and seeking to answer them. And in doing so, giving us a full view of what salvation is and what it means to be a believer in first century Rome. So, the summary is as thus, uh, is like this. In the first two chapters, we read that salvation is needed by all. It doesn't matter whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman or a boy or a girl. The same salvation is required by all. There are no other ways around it. There are no back doors. There are no uh, uh, long-standing arrangements that's, that navigate us past salvation. No, salvation is something required for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And that's the, that is the, the, the theme of those first two chapters. And when the interlocutor comes in and asks, well, what about the law? What about us who have obeyed the law? What about obeying the law? No, everyone needs to be saved, Jew or Gentile. We're all in need of the very same transformation that Jesus has provided. Then, chapters 3 to 5, we read there that salvation is received by faith. It's not earned by works. That it is something that we put our faith in. It is not something that we make up on our own. It's not something that is within our strength. It is something that Christ has done for us. It's something that Christ has accomplished for us and he offers to us. And it is ours simply when we put our trust in him as Lord and Savior. It says this, For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. So everybody needs salvation. And salvation is available by faith, not by money, not by works, not by anything else, just by trusting in the Savior. Then in chapter 68, we thought about how salvation is new life in the Spirit. It's a transformation of the individual. 
It's a transformation of our hearts, making us into something that we never were before. He says, we were in a place for the mind set on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. So if we're saved, we are transformed into this spiritual life, the third person of the Godhead has come to indwell us and he enables us to obey the law of God. So we obey the law of God not by force, not because it's imposed upon us, but because it's part of our nature, because we have a nature now that says we want to follow in God's footsteps. So salvation is new life in the Spirit, chapters 6 to 8. And then in chapters 9 to 11, we read there that this salvation, the salvation that everyone needs, the salvation is that we receive by faith, that salvation that brings us into the life of the Spirit, has always been God's central plan. That everything he's been doing, when we go back into the old covenant and we see God choosing a people for himself in order to bring the Messiah into their world, when we see his forbearance with them, when we see his care of them, when we see the birth of Jesus, everything that is done, this has been God's plan. It's always been God's plan. It's not a plan B. It's not a change in direction. It's not something he had to put in place because things were going wrong. No, this was God's way. It has always been God's way. And everything that has been leading up to Christ and to his death on the cross has been God's plan. And everything that follows it is God's plan. It tells us in Romans 11, Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgment and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever. I think in these, uh, in these chapters we have this wonderful picture of God in sovereign control of all things. And all things working out as he has planned. And so he brings, us, brings history through to the place that he wants it to be. In Romans 12, we began a new theme. Well, it really is a a reintroduction of a theme that has happened previously. Because here in Romans 12, we find out what it is to live a life of the Spirit. What practically it actually means to be alive in the Spirit of God. And we thought there in the first two verses that it's being transformed, not conformed. Transformed not conform. Verses 1 and 2 says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good, acceptable, and perfect. And this is sits over the rest of these chapters as we discuss what it is to be transformed and not conform. And in verses 4 to 6, we thought there, it's about having the character to serve. It's about having the character to serve in the body of Christ, to be part of a community, and to use your gifts for the good and the blessing of others. In verse 10, we thought about how it's practicing love in the family of God. It's learning how to love other people. And we know that love is a very practical thing in scriptural terms. It's not a warm, fuzzy feeling. It's about doing good to others. Just as God loves us, and we know that, because he does good to us. It tells us there that we are to outdo one another in showing honor. And then, in verses 18 to 21, we are to do all in the power of God's goodness. That it is the goodness of God that empowers everything that we do. That it's what enables us to live the life of the Spirit. And so, we, as we enter chapter 13, we are continuing on the theme of being transformed, not conformed. What it means to live a Christ life life compared to what it means to live a life that's just the same as everybody else. And that leads us to this, what I think is a strange passage, a strange theme when it comes to, to holiness. One I would not have 
expected. It's one of those things like finding a pair of socks in the freezer. It just comes out of nowhere. But we understand it because it seems to be a theme that comes up in various guises throughout the New Testament. Titus 3, verse 1, we read, Remind them, does it remind the the people of God to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work. So there are other passages that talk about our relationship to authority, our relationship to government. And so we have to begin this passage by realizing that our response to government, and by that we mean human government, because there is, a, there is a school of thought that says this is about spiritual authority. This is about uh, the work of the angels and demons and spiritual beings out there. But that argument really is not a very, uh, is not a very uh, convincing one. Given what we read here, it can only be human authority that's in view here. And what we are, what we are com- having to come to terms with in this passage is how we respond to human, human government affects how we stand before God. Is a response to who we are before God. And to be a good Christian means to be a good citizen. What it does not mean is that we're to be a compliant citizen. I don't believe for a second it means that we have to go along with everything the government says. It has been used in the past for that. I read a story uh, this week about the South African government reading this passage to people to make sure that they understood that they, as an apartheid government, were authoritative enough to have Christians submit to them in the laws that they were making. And it's a misuse of the passage. We're not meant to be docile citizens. We're not just meant to agree with everything the government says, but we are meant to be good citizens. And I hope, I hope uh, what I say helps us understand it. And I'm saying this on the basis I am not an expert and I'm not a political person in, in, in any way, shape, or form. So you may disagree with me in various points. That's not, that's not an issue because I don't, I don't profess to be an expert in these things. But I want to draw broad strokes here to help us think about who we are as men and women of God under the law of the land in which we live. The first thing I want to think about is human government as God's design. Human government as God's design. Romans 13 verse 1 says, Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. I read a passage like this, and immediately that wee 30 watt light bulb goes off in my head, and it starts blinking and saying, this sounds difficult. There's something going on here. There is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. I think this raises tough questions for us as Christians, doesn't it? It's maybe all right in the light of the governments we know and understand in the West because we can look at our government, we can look at Keir Starmer and the Labour government today and we can see things that are good about what they do because we, well, we, we have our uh, facilities, we have our police force, we have the, our army, we have the, the NHS, we have all of the things that we depend on that are good for our life and they seem to do us good and there's, a, there's an effort and there's a desire to, to bolster them and make sure everything works well for the good of citizens. But we also know that there are bad things. There are things that they do that we do not agree with. There are things that you will disagree with and maybe I will agree with. We'll all have different opinions, but there will, be, there will be nuances. There will be thoughts that we will have. And some will say, well, he's wrong in this. He's right on this. They're wrong in this. They're right on that. And we will have had that with every government that we've ever had. And so that's not such a problem. Understanding that God has set government in place and it it provides for our good, that is a a reasonable thing. But how do you square the circle whenever you think about other governments that have existed in the past? Because there's lots of governments that have existed and they're not just bad in the nuance. They're not just wrong in the small things, but they're wholly evil in so many ways. Do we think that God put Hitler in charge of Germany before the Second World War? Do you think that Chairman Mao was elevated by God to lead China into communism? 
Do we believe that God set Stalin at the head of the Russian uh, state? I find that a real struggle, I have to admit. That God set these people in this place at a particular time and then watched, knowing they would do all of these terrible things that they have done. That they have let, have vented their spleens in murder and death in so many lives and in the destruction of so many things? Do I think that God set them there with the intention that they would do this? I'm not so sure that that's what this means. And that might, that might be my fear. That might, might be my inability to stomach such an idea. And I have to admit that before you today. Because it seems to me that if it's true, then God is somehow, somehow implicated in their crimes. That for, and when you think about it logically and reasonably, that you cannot help but say, well, if God did that, well then God is responsible for the results. And I know that is not true because I don't believe a God who does these things. The first thing we have to understand when we think about this is that God knew, or the Apostle Paul knew the dilemma when he was writing this letter. Paul was part of the Roman Empire. He was writing to people who lived in the capital city of the Roman Empire. And he knew that they were living under a government that was not friendly to the gospel in any way, shape, or form. In fact, there were no Christian governments. No Judeo-Christian ethics that were widely accepted within the positions of power within the world at this time. Paul knew that whenever he was a believer, and as a believer he was writing to churches filled with men and women who sat under legal systems and people with authority that had no time or respect for them. And yet he does not say, these governments don't mean anything to you. You just can ignore everything they say and just go about your merry way. Don't trust them. Don't follow them. Don't go. No. He himself is a law-abiding man and he encourages us, encourages those people to be law-abiding people. And he steers us to this idea that it has been instituted by God. There are people who will take the lead within our nations. There are it is legitimate for human beings to take the role of responsibility within nations and within organizations. And that is a way that human life works. That he has designed our societies to work like this. And I think that's true, isn't it? Because even when you go back into the Old Testament, you think about God talking about the rebellion of nations. He never talks about them being illegitimate. God never says that they shouldn't be doing it or they shouldn't be ruling or they have no right to, to, to exercise authority over the people. Even in their rebellion against him, Psalm 2 says this, Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. God doesn't tell us that these people have no right. No, he tells us they're doing the wrong things. He tells them that they're going their own, their own way. He tells us that they're turning against him. But he doesn't say they have no right to rule. And then we have the various occasions and the various people who we see God raising to positions of authority within Scripture. Usually as good influences on leaders who have risen to the top of their field. Think of Esther this morning. This woman that God moved into a position of authority where she could influence her husband as her ass. Think of Joseph, who was sold by his brothers and placed in high position in Egypt through all sorts of trials and, and troubles so that he could enact a, a good plan and save Egypt and his family from the famine that came into the land. Think of Daniel, who advised king after king in, Bab in Babylon after being kidnapped as a boy and taken from his home. We know that God has the authority to put people in place in various situations. 
But it seems to me that by and large, we get the leaders that we choose. By and large, it's the people. It's us human beings who set governments in place, or at least support governments in place. And when we put a government into place and into authority, it's usually one that reflects who we are. I think it uh, is something like what happens in Romans 1. In Romans 1, we see there that when people turn away from God, when people embrace sin, that God gives them over to their sin, that he gives them what they want. The part of the judgment of God is that when we choose wickedness, he gives us wickedness. He doesn't put a wall between us and vileness. No. If we choose to go down that path, that is the way we go. If we look before the Second World War, Germany was in the doldrums, wasn't it? Because of what happened during the First World War, because of their wickedness and because of the reparations that were being made or being demanded because of their wickedness. And what did they want? The people as a whole wanted someone to blame for their woes. They wanted some way to climb out of this depression that their reparations had gotten them into. They wanted to be back on top. And so they got a leader who promised them all those things with all the vileness that he brought with them. Think of us as a Western nation. What sort of government do the people want in Scotland? What type of government do the people want in the UK? Well, we want one that uh, works on economic gain, don't we? That's why, before the election happened, the Conservatives were giving money out, weren't they? They were telling us they were going to give us tax breaks on this and tax breaks because they think, well, we work on how much money we're going to have in our pocket, and that's how we'll vote. They think we work. We only want one that works on human logic. We don't want a government that tells us about God's demands and about God's ways and about, more, about God's morals. No, we want moral relativism. We want things our own way. And it seems to me that we, when we think about God setting nation, or, uh, governments in place, what he's telling us, that he has ordained that men and women, that it is nations who will choose their, their leaders. And they will get the leader that they want most of all. Think about what happened in Israel. You remember when Saul came to the throne? The people said, we want a king so we can be like all the other nations. And that's exactly what they got. They got King Saul, who led according to his own gut. He led according to his own needs, according to his wants, and ignored God by and large. And so, friends, we begin our time together as we think about what it is to be subject to authority. To remember that God has appointed our governments. He has appointed that we will get the leaders that we choose. That we are responsible and that our leaders are responsible for the way they lead us. And that we are responsible for how for the power and for the support that we give to them. So I don't see this so much as God's righteous decree, certainly not in all cases, perhaps in some, but certainly that the world works in the way that God has ordained it works. And whenever we choose a government, we get the government that we want. The second thing I see here in this passage is not only that we get the government that we want, but that governments are responsible. Governments are responsible. Verses 2 to 5 says this, Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a tire to good contact, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is an authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. If you, if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. Friends, God, God has made it so that people, certain people will rise to the position to lead their nation. There will be human government in this world, but government has responsibility to God. They are responsible to bless the good and punish the wicked. That is, they are to encourage, promote, protect what God values, 
and discourage, dissuade, and destroy all that God hates. And when we look at government, that's what they're supposed to do in God's eyes. And because they are required to do that, we are to be good citizens. We are to understand that they rightly wield power to bless the good and to punish the evil. And that is their responsibility before God. And we hold them up before God that they will do this. But I think this also brings us to the limits of our submission because what happens when the opposite is the case? We know, don't we, that governments don't always bless the good and punish the bad. Even our Western governments at times end up punishing the good and blessing the bad, exhorting us to wickedness and condemning us for righteousness. Friends, we don't have to look very far to see governments like that. We don't have to look past Holyrood. We don't have to look past Westminster in order to see that happening, even in Western governments. Friends, how do we believers respond to a government who does that, at least in some part? Well, I think we have the example of the Word of God that shows us the reality of this. We saw it back in 1 Samuel 21. What did Saul's soldiers do whenever Saul told them to kill Ahimelech the priest? They said, no. They said, no. What did Hananiah, Michael, and Azariah do when they were commanded to bow down before Nebuchadnezzar's gold image and worship it? They said, no, in Daniel 3. And what about Simon, Peter, and the apostles? Whenever the council told them that they were not to preach in the name of Jesus anymore, what did they say? They said, no, we must obey God rather than men. And of course, what did Jesus do? Jesus followed the path of holiness no matter what the in authority said. Friends, here is, our, here is the, the line which we come to. We support our government and the good things that it does, and government does wonderful things for us, and it is a wonderful, stable life that we have. If we were living in uh, Israel at this time or in Ukraine or in some of those wars, we would know what it is when government breaks down and when things are difficult, but we have it easy, don't we? And we love the fact that we have this stable life and by and large, it's due to the governments that God has ordained to rule over us. But friends, there are things which we say no to, aren't there? There are things where we say this far and no further. We don't rebel using brock, uh, bottles and bricks or poison social media posts or personal attacks. No, we simply, oh, we simply turn away and do what is right. Friends, our oh, allegiance is to God. And the way we are good citizens is that we continue to do what is good. The way we are good in our citizenship and support our government is we continue to do what is moral and what is right, what God loves, and to turn away from what God hates. This is the best way to be good citizens. This is the best way to stand for what is right. This is the best way to influence our society. This is the best way for us to stand and support the government when it's doing well. We obey God rather than men, and we show by example what it is to live in holiness and righteousness. I'm not saying that's easy. In our current world, that takes a lot of thought. It takes a lot of courage, especially in, in difficult uh, uh, jobs and difficult roles in life. We have to tread carefully and think about the path that we are to take. But friends, we want to be men and women who are known as God's men and women. And therefore, we ought to be obedient to his command. The third thing we see here is that human governments are responsible to use taxes appropriately. What a, what a, what a subject for uh, a sermon. Verses 6 to 7. Because of this, you have also pay taxes for the authorities are ministers of God Attending to this very thing, pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. Friends, we can't get away from it. We'll have to pay our taxes. I'm going to have to go back and fill mine out now because I haven't done it yet. 
but taxes are the means by which governments operate. And therefore, if the government is going to do well, they have to have our taxes. But friends, there's responsibility on government to use them well. Think about the believers in Rome. Their tax money was going to the emperor. Their tax money was going to fuel the corruption in the Roman system. Their tax money ended up in pagan temples and financing unspeakable evil in the name of the emperor's glory. But the Apostle Paul says, pay your taxes. Just as Jesus says, pay your taxes. And this is where we know we are, because sometimes our conscience says no. Sometimes we feel that paying our taxes, and paying our taxes, we bear the blame for our government's sins. But Paul doesn't say that. And certainly Jesus doesn't say that. And Jesus paid taxes to the Roman governments and was not implicated in their wickedness. Friends, we are... We're content to pay what we owe, aren't we? Despite what our government does wrong, despite how our government treats the gospel and treats the people of God, because we know that there is much they do good, that our taxes pay for our schools, our emergency service, our armed forces, the NHS, our court and prison services, our social services. We thank God for what they do right, and we know that God will hold them to account for what they do not. So what are we concluding this morning in this, what I think is a very strange sermon? Like it or not, our response to authority, to human authority, is related to our holiness in the eyes of God. If we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds, if we have been transformed by the renewing of our minds, then we are people who recognize authority in human form in human affairs, is God's given design. And those who take up this task are responsible to God for what they do. It's not a light thing. Therefore, we ought to pray for them. Therefore, we ought them to encourage them to do what is right. Therefore, we ought them to show by example what it is to be right. Because on the day of judgment, our politicians, our leaders, will stand before God and there they will give an account not only for the, what they did personally, but what they did in the name of their governments and the name of their nations. To be transformed by the Spirit is to give that support, but also to give it knowing that we obey God rather than men. That holiness is the path that we tread. Friends, I know this isn't easy. I've worked in industry too. I've shared offices and workplaces with other people. And to be a believer in those situations is not always easy. Because of the people you work with, because of the requirements that are placed upon you, and because of everything that presses in upon your heart and mind, and including that, our desire to be accepted and to be seen just like everybody else. And so, when we read this, it may be a strange thing. Maybe it's not something we think about often, but it is a tough thing to meditate upon, especially as we apply it in our lives. And so, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to know that it matters. It matters. When you go to work tomorrow, and, some, and your boss requires you to do something that is against your conscience, it matters how you respond. And you have to weigh carefully what that means. No one outside can tell you. No one like me can stand on the sidelines and point to your life and say, you need to do this or you need to do that. Friends, but the Lord will show you. If the Lord has said this is the way he wants us to act and the way he wants us to go and the decision that he wants to make, the Spirit will help us in our weakness if we but trust him. We can rest in that fact that God knows the way that we take. And when we seek to act appropriately, we know that God will move, and we know that God will help, and we know that God will guide. So I want to encourage you, whatever it is that's pressing upon your heart and mind, from, government, from the law of the government, from our bosses, from the people who are around us, friends, it matters how we respond, but the best way to respond is to trust in the Lord and obey Him rather than men. And only you, only you,
can say how that will turn out. But we know that God's blessing will be upon us. And we know that our mistakes are not forever. That we do our best with the Spirit's help. And that there will be another day in which we will learn and take a better step, perhaps. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this passage. We thank you for how it speaks to us in such practical terms. Even, Lord, though perhaps maybe it's hard to understand, and perhaps even we have differences of opinion on how it's applied. But, Father God, we just pray that you will be with us. Help us in our thoughts. And, Lord, as we meditate upon it, Lord, help us in work. Help us in our home lives. Help us in all different areas to be good citizens. And by that, of course, we mean that we obey you. We follow your example and we do the, go the path that you have set for our feet. And so show the world the wonder and the majesty of the triune God. Amen. Amen.